Okay, then we have the last talk for Alexander Unziker. So thank you for coming. This is an impressive audience. To me, that means you didn't have enough fun at the conference, right? Did you? <laughs> and uh, now my title is Newton's Error, Space and Time Might Be Illusions. This is, is such a terrible <coughs> message. And um, well, I think Klaus Lemmertzahl, we have so lovely discussions, but I think he's to blame that you go home with such a depressing message of the en at the end of a physics conference. Um, well, however, if we try to do fundamental physics, I think we should um, take a look at this problem of space and time. And it relates uh, to, my, uh, uh, to yesterday's talk I gave about uh, fundamental constants. And uh, well, um, numbers arbitrarily chosen by God do not exist and their alleged existence relies on our incomplete understanding. I think that fundamental constants in physics have indeed taken the role of godhoods. These are modern godhoods, limits of our knowledge we declare unexplainable and just accept it. Oh, this is a constant of nature, but I think we must wonder about. And as I tried to uh, have explained yesterday in my talk about constants of nature, real progress in physics is always done by eliminating constants of nature. Um, and I think there is a general structure we can observe in the history of science. Uh, if you look at scientific revolutions, there is always a visionary idea, then there is a revolutionizing equation, and then at the end of the process you have end up with one constant less. I give you examples. Newton's law of gravitation, the great idea was, oh, uh, the apple and the moon follow the same uh, kind of gravity. Uh, then of course you have to think about the mathematics, the inverse Crillo. At, at the end you end up with reducing uh, fundamental constants. Before Newton this would have considered something very important the acceleration on Earth, but now it's just a local parameter. Another example is uh, light is an electromagnetic wave, a fantastic idea, intuitive idea, yet without math. And if you uh, do the mathematics with Maxwell equations, you end up with this revolutionizing equation. That means the electric and magnetic constants are related to the speed of light. And you end up with one constant less. Last example, there are a couple of examples in history, but um, well, what Bohr did was think about the constant h. It might be an angular momentum in atomic physics. That was the great idea. And he worked it out, and at the very end, Rydberg's constant h uh, is not anymore fundament fundamental. It uh, can be expressed by other constants of nature that you end up with one constant less. So I think this is an important general uh, picture. And uh, there is a simple measure for progress in fundamental physics, elimination of free parameters or fundamental constants. And this relates also to uh, the picture of science provided by Thomas Kuhn in his famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Uh, you're doing observations and you have a model and then you have an anomaly and often it, uh, this in order to not to falsify the entire theory, a free parameter, parameter is added to the model and then you have usually complication of the model. And well, I mean, of course, today we have a, a very, very complicated model with dozens of free parameters. I mean, if you like this and, and think it's, it's useful, this talk is probably not for you. But um, I think that, by the way, that's the deeper reason uh, you come here to have fun because it's so intellectually boring at the very end and you might be making fun of, of some ideas presented uh, today here but I can tell you if Einstein and, and Dirac they would have at least as much fun looking at this model I think. If the Lord Almighty had asked me before embarking creation I should have recommended something simpler that uh, what's the comment 
about geocentric astronomy was from King Alfonso. I think we are reminded by the modern models of this situation. So let's consider fundamental constants, uh, maybe the most fundamental constants, big G, C, and uh, Planck's constant. And well, I, again, I'm, I'm going very fast over the next topic, which is there is an idea to get rid of, of uh, the gravitational constant C, and it goes back to an old overlooked idea by Einstein in 1907 and 1911. Actually, it was his first idea about general relativity, and it's about uh, variable speed of light theory, but there are other, other references, you can look that up. And interestingly, a lot of other people, without knowing, uh, had similar ideas, like most importantly, Robert Dickey in 1957, all this is a Markian approach uh, relating gravity to the universe, and also Evan Schrödinger had interesting contribution, Dennis Schama, and all this is also related to Dirac's hypothesis, to Dirac's large numbers. Um, well, that, that in principle, the proposal would be that one, to get rid of the, of the gravitational constants. As I said, I talked elsewhere about this. Um, so you might be surprised, but I, there are still a lot of details to work out, but let's go ahead. I take for granted now that G, big G in principle can be eliminated. But we still have two uh, fundamental contents left, C and H, and you have to ask yourself, why do they exist? Couldn't it be possible that physics is done without any fundamental constants? And why two? Why two? Why not three? Why not another number of fundamental constants? So this is a problem. And um, if you take the perspective of Thomas Kuhn, we could also think that C and H are anomalies that have shown up because there is an underlying problem in the model. And the model is here the very idea of space and time uh, developed by, by Isaac Newton. I mean, it was wonderful, the, the, the foundation of modern physics, and he developed a lot of concepts, but he did not question the existence of three-dimensional space and one-dimensional time. And Planck's constants and the speed of light, they might be anomalous, anomalies in this Kuhnian sense. Of course, we're talking about a very long time scale here. But think about, I mean, the speed of light discovered in, in, in 1678, it was just an astronomical curiosity. And Newton wasn't aware of it, but there is no, absolutely no reason from Newtonian mechanics that matter shouldn't be accelerated beyond the speed of light. So the, the fact that you can't accelerate it is an anomaly that presents a problem. So the very existence of such a limited speed is a failure of Newtonian physics at the large scale. And the same thing happens at the small scale. With uh, age and quantum mechanics, there is no reason a priori why there should be a violation of, uh, of, of differentiability and continuity. I mean, we, we physicists use a lot of math and, and the mathematicians, they, they grant us this excuse, oh, you have to do quantum corrections if you're at small scales. Why? There should be a reason. Okay. So the ex very existence of age is a failure of Newtonian physics at the small scale. And this existence of C and H indicate there is something wrong with the axioms of Newtonian physics, space, and time. And, well, of course, I mean, once the error is based like a foundation stone in the ground, everything is built thereupon, never more it returns to light. It's not easy um, uh, to realize this, I think. Space and time, I mean, they are so obvious in our everyday life and they are certainly the concepts that are most easily accessible for human perception, no doubt. But they may be inappropriate when it comes to describe reality on a fundamental level. This is a real possibility. So, if you want to do physics, we try to find explanation. Is the book of nature written in mathematical language? I mean, 
I use the Mark string theory, and you might be surprised that I advocate here. We should think about, I mean, uh, imagine just a very intelligent extraterrestrial civilization doing physics. Uh, is there any reason why they sh uh, should use fundamental constants, something like that? Couldn't there be a possibility that you describe all your, your reality with pure math? I think we should uh, think about that, but it's not really hard. And I think it's, uh, well, there are a lot of questions one should wonder about. Uh, physics is about explaining reality. There is no reason why nature should have such a peculiar three plus one dimensional form. Can you name one? I don't think so. There is a reason. Why there are those distinct forms of phenomenology, light and matter? I think this is strange and I think it's much more interesting than the usual question of, of what is particle and what is wave. Space and time may be inappropriate concepts for a fundamental understanding of reality. And now if you think about um, a sequence of tangent spaces in a three-dimensional manifold may indeed mimic four dimensions. What do I mean by this? Uh, this is a tangent space and I, I depicted here uh, a two-dimensional uh, surface. Uh, but if you imagine a sequence of, of two-dimensional surfaces here, every, every surface is different, okay? Everything plane is different. If you go along in the sphere, you see a sequence of, of uh, two-dimensional spaces and the same holds in three dimensions. So our reality could be indeed only three-dimensional and we're looking out at the tangent space and see some sequence we perceive at time, not in a very direct way, but that's, that's a possibility. In general, I mean, what mathematical structure could possibly describe reality? It should be as simple as possible due to Occam's razor, but it must be sufficiently rich to describe all the physical phenomenology. A scalar is obviously too simple. Complex numbers are used in, in quantum mechanics, but this is not a solution because you need a, a complex function for every particle, for electrons and other particles, so at the very end would, you would end up with the mess of the standard model, which is hugely complicated. So you think about a more uh, uh, sophisticated structure than complex numbers, and obviously quaternions could be an interesting thing, and, um, oops, and and you could consider unit quaternions. The unit, uh, unit quaternions are equivalent to the three sphere S3, also to the uh, complex two, plus, uh, two times two matrices. And interestingly, this group SU2 is a double cover of the rotations in three-dimensional space, S, S3. There is a, uh, they're a simple connected. This is a very unique property of this S3. Uh, manifold is Poincaré um, uh, Poincaré's um, law and there is also a very nice uh, property of Hopf vibration very intriguing uh, math that, that comes up here so if you speculate about a mathematical description of reality I mean the usual thing is you have R3 and T and a, a function uh, to, to the complex numbers. That would be the usual quantum mechanical wave function. And instead of C, I, I, I said you could think about S3, that might be a, a richer structure that can account for the phenomenology. But if you think about in terms of geometric, uh, of um, differential geometry in, in a fiber, uh, fiber bundles, so it, you could even think if this is true, if it's uh, really R3 and T, or if the world we live in is also an S3, and uh, reality is, well, I don't know, all possible maps from S1 to S3, or, or all possible maps from S3 to S3. I mean, you know, I'm not coming up with a solution here. I mean, I know this is, could be considered very half-baked ideas, but I think if you want to do progress, we have to, to ask these, these elementary questions. Um, well, there is another, I recently discovered that, that paper discussing um, action at a distance and he related to S3 and S7, interestingly, just to mention. And uh, I think we have a couple of intriguing observations that point, that point to the fact that indeed S3, the three-dimensional unit sphere, might have uh, uh, relevance for the description of reality. Um, 
uh, the tangent space of S3 could be related to the light cone observation at a distance. It is just an approximation. You could re couldn't really look at, uh, at far points far away instead of a twisted phenomenon in straight space because uh, photons must have uh, spin. Light could be a straight phenomenon in a twisted space because S3 is inherently twisted. And most interestingly, S3 is the double cover of SO3 that appears to be intimately related to the ex existence of spin. I might remind you that there is no explanation that spin has to exist in physics as a fundamental concept. So, so you must wonder about the question where it comes from in a very natural way is, is a double cover of these uh, th uh, rotations in three-dimensional space. And S3, or if you take the group, SU2 has very interesting um, um, properties. It's, it's not abelian, it uh, does not commute. So it reminds you very much from this uh, commutator relations uh, in, in the angular momentum operators in quantum mechanics. And this, this non-commutativity of S3 might be a reason for the existence of age. And interestingly, the Lie algebra, if you, it's a kind of uh, differentiation of the group, is, uh, could mimic R3. It's, uh, it's a very uh, similar structure to our usual three-dimensional space. Uh, well, it's just a uh, uh, Lie group and Lie algebra would be, would be related to the tangent space here. Well, uh, to conclude, revolutions in physics have always eliminated arbitrary numbers. A complete theory of reality must do without any so-called constants of nature. C and H are anomalies that cast out on the basis of Newtonian physics, space and time. And there is no reason why reality should have such a peculiar three plus one dimensional structure. Space and time may be inappropriate concepts for describing reality at a fundamental level. A sequence of tangent spaces, as I said, may create the illusion of one more dimension. Reality might just be S3. And, well, I already mentioned this. C is related to light and H would be related to matter. A lot of problems, of course, would be, turn out to be ill-posed questions. That's just wave particle duality and so on and so on. Also, the unification of quantum mechanics and rel relativity could be an ill-posed problem. And there is a little article on the internet uh, about this. And all this started with the paper of in, uh, in Anal de Physique in 2009. It's about the Einstein 1911 approach and related ideas. And you can find something in here in my popular book about physics, which is a translation of that science book of the year in 2010. And this is another book coming up with a second edition now. And this is a critique of particle physics. You find more about the standard model here. And the idea, the, the closest thing to my talk today is in chapter 11 of Einstein's Lost Key. And there is also a YouTube channel where you can have fun. Okay, thank you very much.